to create those uh, images. Now you can do all that in a computer. And it's really easy in Photoshop. You can do that in After Effects in, in Premiere. It's amazing with technology, how advanced it is that that's not very hard for someone to do nowadays. But back then when you had to use it using this old film processing technique, that must have been, I mean, I, I don't even know how they were able to pull it off. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Pinedo Brothers Podcast. I'm JP. And I'm Peter. Thank you so much for joining us. We've got a wonderful guest today, my very good friend, an incredible filmmaker and graphics designer, VFX director, Carlos de la Vega, CM de la Vega, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. What's up, amigos? And thank you, JP. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for having me on your podcast. Ah, it is our great pleasure. We are excited. Uh, Peter and I met Carlos back when we were living the Vida Loca in Los Angeles. Uh, Carlos had done it even longer than us. He's, he also saw the light and decided to <laughs> escape, escape the craziness. Uh, Probably around the same time we did, right, Carlos? If I remember right? Um, it was about maybe eight months later. So it was kind of like the escape from LA. You know, we're doing uh, movie <laughs> references. It was definitely an escape from LA, okay. right? Yeah, <laughs> that was good. Uh, you and most of the other people also, that the place is probably a ghost town at this point. <laughs> uh, but Carlos has done, has an amazing resume, and his clients have really scared. Like when someone is as talented as CM, people continue to wanting him to work for you. So he's kept, he kept his clients going on. You have uh, Thursday Night Football, correct? As well as uh, many Super Bowls, like maybe six Super Bowls at this point that you've done the graphics work for. You also have done uh, several 30 for 30s. You've done your own pilot, What's Up in LA. Uh, you've directed that one. That That's not just the, the graphics for that one, as well as your own feature film. So you have quite the resume and we're so excited to have you here with us. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, What's Up in LA was awesome. That was actually directed by my friend, um, Rodolfo Rudy Zales, um, but he, we both co-wrote, co-produced Awesome Family Sitcom. Yeah, that was beautiful. I loved it. Um, but we're actually, the most recent thing you've done is a fascinating course um, that teaches, you know, someone like me that's interested in graphics design how to really become a true expert in this field. I, I, really, I, I really encourage others to check it out. Go check out aemastercourse.com. This course, he's got three levels here and the advanced one is the one I just went through. It really is truly an amazing, you show people how to go through and make their own en intro credit sequence as good as something like, oh, you know, Run Lola Run might be or something like that. Yeah, that was one of the main things coming into um, creating this advanced three. So advanced three After Effects course. And it's all that knowledge, all those 14 years of um, working in After Effects, just downloading all that information into this course. And, and along the way, also make it very practical, have something that the student could um, incorporate all the lessons that I'm presenting that they're learning at the same time, but actually use them in a very practical way. And what more practical than creating a really cool uh, TV or movie credit sequence. And it really teaches them, you know, teaches them how to use After Effects in a fun, innovative way. Absolutely. I can attest to that firsthand. So what we wanted to do is have a fun time here with CM and we want to choose some of our favorite intro or outro credit sequences and kind of dissect them and show them what makes them tick. So we've all brought one or two of our favorites <laughs> and we'll just go through and say why they're so amazing. How's that sound everybody? Perfect. Okay. Do it. Yeah. Great. Without any further ado, we'll go to my pick. Thank you. 
Mm. So that was Around the World in 80 Days. Peter, do you remember watching that as a kid? Yeah, I do. Yeah. <laughs> Carlos, have you seen that one? No, I haven't seen that one. And it was the first time I was watching the, the credit sequence. And wow, it, it was it was great, but it was um, it was long. You know, back then, they, <laughs> they, they didn't care how long it was. Like nowadays, you have like 60 seconds, 30 seconds, and you got to cram all that in, you know? Right. Yeah. People That's are right. like, wait. <laughs> What's you going could on? not get away with that these days. Mm -mm. Like that, mm -mm. Like that would be complete. Let me let me check how long that was. I think it was like six minutes long. Wow. But anyway, <laughs> it was wow. it was made by the great. You probably heard of him, the great title sequence designer Saul Bass, who did a lot of Hitchcock films. Um, mm. uh, and he did for about he did up until Scorsese. So from baby, basically the 1940s till Scorsese times. He I wow. think the last one he did was Casino. So that was in wow. the 90s. Um, Saul Bass was like king of the intro title sequences. And this guy is really at the height of his powers back in 1956. Mm -hmm. A few things. I won't dwell too long on what I really love about this because I want to get to the others. But a few things that I, I appreciate in looking at this, especially as a filmmaker, is how it's a celebration of film. They have so many different um, ideas that are really filmic ideas. For example... Um, when they have a certain character represented on the screen as, so, for example, the angelfish, um, that's the main love interest of, of, the, of the main character. So it's, it's presented with an ID fixie, which is a, a, a theme that is representative of that emotion and of that idea. So you see that, that little fish and then you understand that's what this character is and what she actually brings to this story. Um, which is, you know, it's just a microcosm of who this character is as, on a larger scale. But we need that shorthand in film. Film is a language and it speaks to us on an emotional level without us realizing it. And so that brings up something that, uh, that us filmmakers appreciate and try to do. Another thing I think I really enjoy about it is um, how it manages, even though it's long, it, it tells the entire story of the movie in like six minutes. And it's like a three hour long movie. So you watch that, you kind of actually see what the movie is. And it's kind of, a, it's kind of watch, like watching up that sequence, the, mm. and, and like the first 11 minutes where it tells the story of a life just with, with song and moving images. This does very much the same. Um, all, but it's much more humorous. Uh, it's one joke after another. Saul Bass was great at telling jokes. So that's a few things. Besides the vibrant colors, the incredible sense of scale and design, this guy was an architect, Saul Bass. So he understood what lines did um, and how we interpret them and how they, they represent an interior state. So a brilliant title designer. But shall we move on? Do any, if anyone else has thoughts, please do share. Yeah, I love the use of geometry of lines, like you mentioned, James, lines, but also squares, circles. It's just, it's, just, it's, it's amazing, you know, just the use of, of, of geometry. It, it kind of reminds me of uh, Gaudi, you know, using geometry, using mathematics to make it all, you know, work together in the right ratios. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah, I think that the, especially the part that really stuck out to me was the where there was different colors and then they turned into squares or to rectangle and then I like that moved forward. I thought that transition was really cool where it was like a very abstract thing. And then he like all of a sudden made it into a very concrete, like a, you know, something you understand as a train. And then that moved the, the sequence along. I thought that was really clever. He's a great storyteller, old soul. But we're moving on to a different artist now, radically different. And I, I'll, let, I'll let the sequence speak for itself. How about that?
der Mensch. Die wohl geheimnisvollste Spezies unseres Planeten. Ein Mysterium offener Fragen. Wer sind wir? Woher kommen wir? Wohin gehen wir? Woher wissen wir, was wir zu wissen glauben? Wieso glauben wir überhaupt etwas? Unzählige Fragen, die nach einer Antwort suchen. Eine Antwort, die wieder eine neue Frage aufwerfen wird. Und die nächste Antwort wieder die nächste Frage und so weiter und so weiter. Doch ist es am Ende nicht immer wieder die gleiche Frage und immer wieder die gleiche Antwort. Ball ist rund, Spiel dauert 90 Minuten, so viel ist schon mal klar. Alles andere ist Theorie. Und ab. I selected Run Lola Run. It's it's one of my uh, favorite, I guess, foreign films. Um, if you can, you know, say foreign films category, I guess, is one of my favorite films in that category of foreign or international films. Um, yeah, it's one of the things that I really like about this title sequence is, is the use of different mixed media. Um, I believe it came out in the year 2000. So this was probably done in 98, 99. This the first part where you see all the character, uh, the people, those are actual characters from the movie. Um, definitely go see the movie. I don't want to spoil it, but it's pretty much um, our decisions, our actions have consequences. And if we take certain actions or certain routes, we can have different outcomes. So that's why you see all those different people at, at the beginning. And it's when I first saw it and I saw the police officer kick the, the soccer ball and everyone goes in and, and turns into the letters of the movie. I thought that was awesome. And then hearing the director's commentary that, that they were using, I believe it was media comp media composer um, or some other early compositing software. Um, I was just kind of blown away. And remember, this was this was where right now in 2022. This was probably 20, 23 years ago. The computer, the computing power that they had back then is nowhere near what we have right now so to pull something like that must have taken like days and weeks you know where right now it's like maybe he can pull it off like in half a day or in a couple hours well maybe um, you could the, carlos maybe you could <laughs> but it's the use of the use of different styles you know doing vf some vfx in the beginning um uh doing vfx in the beginning and then you go into traditional 2d animation um, it's just using different mixed medias is some, some, one of the things that really catches um, my attention. Um, it's just really different than any other title, intro title sequence that I've seen. That's the first, something of that flavor that people had ever seen. It, it had kind of created its own genre of that fast paced kind of frenetic feel 
of a title sequence. It reminds me a lot of, um, they tried to copy it quite a bit, I think, in Scott Pilgrim versus the world. You know, that kind mm, of like, yeah. in your face, beat, beat, throbbing, throbbing, and then, you know, things flashing and, and, the, and Lola's punching, you know, and breaking the title sequence. It's a great motif. I love that. What I see that it has something in common besides being really different. It really speaks to the story itself, just like mm, uh, it does. Uh, around the world in 80 days spoke to the story. It summarized it very, very, very nicely. The same thing ha I see it with run Lola run. I think a common thread is that it needs to be on the theme of the story. You can't just have something really cool. You want to be telling something that people are supposed to be connecting to something else. Definitely, definitely. And it's like, uh, it summarizes, I think, the major themes of the movie. Um, and I think that's what a title sequence should do. It should really summarize what the movie is all about, the main themes of the movie, the main characters. So a well done credit sequence, that's the function, I guess. That's what it serves. It's really like a, a summary, a reader's digest version, I guess you can say, of the entire movie. I love that. Pete, thoughts? Well, I mean, I think it's really cool. It, that's also like a little bit of a, of a longer uh, intro sequence by, by modern standards. And that's definitely much more recent. That's still, I think, what year did you say that was? 1999? Like yeah, 99 98. or 2000. I think around that time it came out. Okay. Yeah. And so, I don't, yeah, I just, I just think that's really interesting that they pulled off that, that longer sequence, but it still really grabs you and it engages you. Um, I think it's, it's, it's kind of a, an ongoing, I think, societal problem today is that our, everyone's attention span is getting like shorter and shorter. <laughs> um, and so you need that like instant, like needing to be moving from one thing to the other. But I think that this one, it, this sequence kind of, it does a really good job of like, it is a constant like movement. So that, that retains your attention in that way. But it also... I mean, it's, it's still a, an artistic piece where it's, it's telling the story through kind of just these, these different kind of graphic images compiling what you are also saying. It's like a mixed media kind of thing with it also showed real people and then with like animations and kind of like cartoonish kind of looking things. Um, so I think, I think that was really cool. I haven't seen the movie though, but I'll have to check it out. It's a good movie. Yeah, it, it's a good movie. I think it's one of those movies that um, you have to watch it a couple of times. There's so many, so many things in it. Every time you watch it, it's another level or you catch more detail. It's like, I guess, uh, the closest thing I can compare it to is like Fight Club. Like the first time I saw it, I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. The second time I watched it, I was like, wow, like I picked up more. Mm -hmm. Third time I watched it, like, oh yeah. my goodness, this is amazing. I picked up so much more. So there's so much detail going on that the more you watch it, the more, um, yeah, the more, the more fun it becomes and the yeah. more exciting, the more you like it. But it's, yeah. it's a, it's a German film actually. And, and it was, I, I believe it was a winner. I don't know if it was the audience award winning at Sundance or just the winner at Sundance. You know, there's the, the awards choice, the audience, I'm sorry, the audience choice or the, the best film out of Sundance, but any, it won one of those categories. And mm. maybe because it was a German film, maybe that was why they could afford to make a longer um, credit sequence. Um, like you're right, Peter, like really in the last 20, 30 years, like in the last 20, 25 years, it become shorter. So maybe because it's a, it's from another country. Um, it's not us. <laughs> maybe they, they can afford to make it longer i don't know i'm just throwing a, a just a hypothesis out there maybe maybe, maybe americans are too dumb i can't take the, the yeah we're all addicted pieces. on tiktok and we can't, we can't yeah we're all addicted on tiktok and we can't handle more than five seconds <laughs> well you know it's funny i i did watch this back in film school and i i really liked outside of the um I thought some of those, the, the bed sequences where she's asking her lover like over and over the same question, like, and he's keeps on saying like, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, probably. I'm like, I, I'm like, okay, I get that. But at the same time, I, when I think back to that frustration, I probably just was missing a lot of the deeper meaning. Um, and the, the rep repetition of it was part of the story. Um, and I also, in thinking back later, I realized, and I didn't even do this consciously, but 
as I'm thinking about this movie, I'm thinking, oh man, I probably ripped off subconsciously a lot of things in the extra work from here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> hopefully, man. hopefully it worked as well as it did in this film. But in any case, uh, Pete, shall we move on to yours? Yeah. Yeah. Mine's a lot shorter. <laughs> All right. Without yeah. any further ado. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> <Speaking of> the <laughs> TikTok. <laughs> Peter, tell or us about this. This fan. is from it's from the TV show Fringe. Yeah, so this is the show, I think, what, what, do you remember what years this came out? Like maybe mid-2000, like 2005, 2004, it, something like it, that? I thought it was, uh, the, it ended in 2011, I'm pretty, or 2000. Okay, so maybe it's like 2008 to 2012, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Um, but a really good show. And something I really like about this sequence is that it does kind of tell a little bit of the story of the show in such a short, like compact little intro sequence right there aside from the music being really good um i think that one of the things i really like about it is that in the past so this is this is the intro sequence for the the fifth season which is the final season and the first four seasons of the show their intro sequence would have those words in the same way but they would have very like like mutations about human nature like just like genetic like deformities and just different kinds of like things that could go wrong or something that would make people different from other people. And in the last season, it switches to things like uh, free will and um, like in at the end of freedom and just this, these different kinds of ideas about the human person that sets them apart. So I thought that was really, I really loved how they kind of had that subtle message of of kind of talking about what the, the whole f first four seasons, you know, they're talking about these deformities that make people different. And then they kind of present it as like these parts of human nature are what make us different from, from everything else and what really sets us apart as humans. So I thought that was a really cool one. I, I, I had a great appreciation from that when I saw it. I was like, wow, that's really cool. Yeah, and I want to go a little, I want to encourage anyone that hasn't seen this show to check it out. I, in my mind, Fringe and The Office are the two best television shows of this millennium. They're, they're, this, this show is amazing. Car have you seen this, Carlos? Fringe? No, I haven't seen Fringe. It's, no. it's an amazing show. J.J. Abrams um, does he, incredible work. And he's speaking about these big ideas that you don't see very often in a television show. You don't, you don't see the idea of free will and what that means for the idea of freedom in our society, as well as fatherhood. And the image of fatherhood that it has is incredible. So this show is, is an, an excellent example of storytelling. And again, you see the microcosm of the entire show told in the opening credit sequence, which is quite a feat. Mm -hmm. especially given yeah how short it is <laughs> yeah i yeah. i think that um andrew kramer from video co-pilot who's one of i guess you can say one of the ogs in after effects tutorials um i'm not 100 percent sure but i'm probably 80 90 maybe 80 percent sure 90 that he made this title sequence for jj abrams because i know that he made that connect with J.J. Abrams and he started to create a, a lot of the title sequences for J.J. Abrams. Um, so I don't know which TV show he started doing it. I know he did for the Star Trek movie that um, Abrams um, directed or produced. I know he did that whole credit sequence and he used some of his plugins um, to create it. So, yeah, um, I, that's good. I think we should it'd be great if we could research it because I'm, I'm almost positive that he created it. And if he did, it's like, man, he did it in after Effects, most likely. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think he did. I'll, I'll research it while we're watching the, Oh, I can't do that. Cause well, anyway, we'll, <laughs> we'll figure that out. I'll leave a comment yeah. in the description. Yeah. 
but it'd be cool because it's 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 some guy you know it's if he actually did it then you know he's provided so much tutorial that's one of the resources that i went to when i was learning mm -hmm. after effects so it's like man like i learned a lot from the guy that made this credit sequence it's like wow it's, it's pretty cool and you know i've met him in real life in person at wow. different events when i was in la um really nice guy down to earth um and um yeah it's good great stuff and and um let's figure out if he actually did it okay we <laughs> will we will we'll figure that out we'll leave it in the we'll description um okay shall we move on i think we have time for does everyone have time for one or two more oh yeah all right moving on There it is. <laughs> there you go. There you go. A short one. <laughs> Another short one. <laughs> um, Tell so us that, about rock and roller. Yeah, that's one of that's one of my um, that's a that's on top of my list. Um, it is a Guy Ritchie film. Um, and by the way, all of most of Guy Ritchie's films have really great credit sequences. He really, he really, if you've seen the, the Sherlock Holmes movies, that's another great um, credit sequence. Uh, but definitely he incorporates, he loves doing very unique, I guess you can say, credit sequences. Um, I just love the style, the style of the art, the silhouette, um, and the camera move, how it's constantly moving. And yeah, it's, it's something that I've actually, you know, studied, try to replicate. Um, it's something that you can do in After Effects, and if so, it's something that you can recreate, um, which which is great because it's a great learning process and learning techniques. Um, so yeah, love well, to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I wanted to say it's it's very much on style with the type of frenetic energy that you have with your own filmmaking. You know, your your sensibilities, I think, as a filmmaker. Correct me if I'm wrong. Are very much like the Robert Rodriguez type of the energy that he brings like the, the almost the re restless spirit that he can translate onto the onto the frame is kind of your sensibility as well and you see that with both of these intro sequences with run lola run pulsating and then uh -huh. this one rock and roller that you know the the bass the heavy like dun dun dun, dun and then the swoosh of the camera move is it 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 creates that interior space that we're always that we always feel when we're watching your stuff as well. So I, I, I get that sense as well. I yeah. love the use of um, what they call 2.5 D effect where it's, you know, 2D images in 3D space. You have X, mm -hmm. right? You have Y, but then you have Z that goes towards us or, or away from us. And it's, 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 it's um, great use of, of using that 2.5 D um, and pulling it off. Mm -hmm. I, I, that's okay. So I just really appreciate how you're, how you've brought up, I think a couple of times, uh, during the course of this conversation, the, the use of like geometry and space and how, um, and how you use that for still storytelling. Uh, because I, I just, I don't, I think that's something that's definitely not very talked about at all today and something that is, is kind of missing, I think it's starting to make a resurgence, but um, I guess in in uh, of, of recent we haven't. That's been a little bit of a, a deprived art form. I feel like just the realization that storytelling and um, you know geometry are actually very tied in together, and you see it like not just in filmmaking. Of course, we're talking about filmmaking right now, but just like in architecture um, and painting and all these different things where it's very important to have this understanding and appreciation of just the natural world and how, uh, what sh different shapes and different um, like lines and, and different curves and how they work together and what they mean and what they, what, how they communicate what an artist is trying to tell 
the viewer or the, or the, uh, the listener. Um, but I just, I really appreciate that. And it's really, it's cool to, to hear you say it kind of you coming from a more of a, of an expert kind of, uh, field right here. Like you're, you, you're very knowledgeable of this and it's really cool to hear that that's actually, that is, um, a major part of these, this kind of, uh, storytelling here with the title sequences. Amen to that. Amen to that. Well, Hey, I wanted to say, um, I know that I want, I want to give Carlos a chance to respond, but I also want to get one more title sequence in there. Uh, do you guys mind if we try and do one more? Yeah, let's squeeze it in. All right. to the end but that of course the good and the bad and the ugly from 1966 one of Cl the, it really put clint eastwood on the map and created a new genre of western the spaghetti westerns which just remade hollywood because they made him over in italy and all of a sudden people in hollywood are like oh hang on wait a second there's something to this we got we got to <laughs> listen to these people and their and their italian directors another thing i want to point out that i really enjoy about this is um it's as opposed to the other sequences that we've seen, if they don't have all the resources of like Saul Bass, the King of Hollywood, or even the, the, the German director for Run Lola Run had, you know, they, it, it, it's gritty, it's messy, it's very limited. You know, it's not as intricate as some of the other ones that we've seen. But even with the simplicity, it tells a story and gives an emotion. Like, I mean, it's basically the emotion of what Quentin Tarantino has in every film now in, the, in his latest films. So they are able to do something with very limited resources, which is inspiring to a filmmaker, filmmaker like me who doesn't have millions of dollars to drop on a credit sequence. Yeah, and when they made it, they used old uh, film techniques to, to create those uh, images. Now, you can do all that in a computer. It's really easy in Photoshop. You can do that in After Effects in, in Premiere. Um, it's, it's, it's amazing with technology how advanced it is that, you know, that's not very hard for someone to do nowadays. But back then when you had to use it using this old film processing technique, that must have been, I mean, I, I don't even know how they were able to pull it off, <laughs> you know, um, using their techniques back in the day. Um, now I see it's like, I'm, when I see it, I'm thinking of what I'm doing, what I would, the steps that I would apply in After Effects, for example, to create those exact look. But just thinking of the tools that they had, I'm like, oh my goodness, these guys were like master at their craft right. to, to create this amazing, is, is simplistic, but it's so beautiful and oh, well, yeah. well, well done. It's gorgeous. Pete, your thoughts? I mean, I think, of course, that's, that's a classic. And I think the fact that they, like you were saying, they were able to do that so long ago when they uh, had that such limited resources is, is really cool. And it's, it's also cool to, I think, to realize that being filmmakers and being, uh, being storytellers with not millions to drop on uh, a movie like Disney or something like that, that you can still tell a very compelling and very, uh, very moving story, even in, in a simple way. Um, and then oftentimes those, the, the simpler it is and the, the, the more compelling it is and the more it touches people. I mean, you have studios like, like, uh, um, I don't know, Carlos, if you've watched the podcast much, but we love to bash Disney on this, <laughs> on this podcast. <laughs> um, 
but uh, but just like you have they have you know they'll drop you know millions of dollars on a movie and you'll get something like you know star wars seven eight and nine where it's just like <laughs> what what did i just watch and what just happened where you have all these crazy visual effects and you and you know and just so much going on but y- did you really like see a, a moving story there mm. and but then you have something like this and you know the with the good the bad and the ugly where it's just a very simple title sequence, um, but it, it evokes more emotion than the entire seven, eight, and nine of Star Wars made by Disney. You know, um, so I think it just goes to show it's not it. You, you know, you can't just throwing money at a wall doesn't tell a good story. You have to it. it you really have to pour yourself into it and really have to. Um, it, it's 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 an art form. It's not a, a matter of, of dollars and cents. That's right. Well, we're running out of time. I know we could come up with another five or 10 or 20, but like at the drop of a hat, but thank you all for having this conversation with me. Carlos, thank you so much for joining us. I encourage everyone check out aemastercourse.com. Uh, if you have any interest in graphic uh, visual effects or graphic design, it's well worth the time and the look. Thank you, JP. Thank you, Peter, so much. Uh, had so much fun just talking about the art of the title, title sequences, this amazing art form that is sometimes, I guess, overlooked, um, but it's so integral to, to the movie or to the TV show. Um, had a blast. Hopefully, I, we, can be, we can do this again. Yes, absolutely. We would love that. Yeah. I'd love to pick your brain about the state of visual effects in film in general. So not going beyond the title sequence, seeing where Definitely. you're like, you know, where, where is the, the, the genre going as far are, are the, the industry going in visual effects? And what are you seeing? Are you liking what you see? I think that's another podcast all to its own. Oh my goodness, we can do uh, like three hours. <laughs> Part, <laughs> like, like the good, the bad, and the, we can do a trilogy on that one. <laughs> I love it. I love like it. it. All right. It's a date then. Yep. Okay, Pete, <laughs> enjoyed the conversation as always. Thanks, Pete. Thank you very much. Thanks, right. Carlos. Thank you, Peter, JP. All right, everyone. We're the Pinedo Brothers, Catholic filmmaking brothers working to revitalize the world of Catholic art through film by making stories about faith, not necessarily faith films. We hope that you enjoyed it and we'll see you all next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Pinedo Brothers Podcast, an artist podcast for Catholics. We hope you enjoyed it, and if so, please consider like, subscribing, and commenting below. That really helps. This episode was edited and recorded by me, JP. Makeup was done by no one, if you couldn't tell. The Pinedo Brothers are Catholic filmmaking brothers working to revitalize the world of Catholic art through film. For more information on us, check us out at PinedoBrothers.com. Thanks again.